a lot, everybody, for joining. Um, we're going to get started. Our focus today, this is going to be the last session that's focused on the whole automated user lifecycle management, right? So we've gone through various topics. We've, you know, set up the connectors. We've pulled data in from LDAP. We've talked about um, the role of the transformation scripts and the synchronization process in general. Last time we went uh, deeper into the key parts of how to uh, build the script. There are a few things that we've kind of left out, um, which are pretty essential to, uh, at least from our experience in, in the projects that we've been doing, where um, we, we need to be able to send out email notifications, so to have feedback to the various users, the, the person requesting, the person receiving, um, you know, the, the, you know uh, the access requests. Um, there's also sometimes when we need to control the workflows a little bit better where um, it's not just about, um, you know, the, the predefined settings that we have, that there might be a need to initiate these workflows um, in, a, in a more, um, in a more of a, um, um, I'm mean, a programmatic kind of an approach, right? And the last couple of things is we've kind of touched on terminations a little bit. We haven't talked about transfers. So I want to go into a little bit more detail about each one of these topics as well. So getting into uh, the, the the email configuration. So in the web console, there is under administration, there is a menu option called mailbox configuration. And in mailbox configuration, you can go ahead and you can basically fill out the form um, to define you know, who the sender is, you know, the SMTP details. Um, and, and also there's some details about, um, you know, if, 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 a, if, if, a, if an SMTP provider is down. And so if you, if you have a high availability system and you need to have redundancy in every single step, then it makes sense that even on the SMTP or SMS layers that you have ability to kind of fail over to another provider. So this would allow us to kind of be able to do that. Now, when we look at the, the whole mailbox uh, configuration, you'll see that there's two parts. There's a configuration and there's a template. The template really is is more about um, for every type of SMTP service that we have, like say Office three sixty five, um, say you know Google Workspace, um, you know there's uh, SendGrid and there's a bunch of these, right? That we've taken a few and we've kind of created predefined configurations that includes like the host names, the ports, the type of communication, just to save people a little bit of effort in getting started with these. So this slide just kind of shows you know a little bit of a sample configuration. We're going to go through this you know, in a minute. Actually, let's go through it right now. So we'll go back to um, our test instance that we had created earlier. Let's just start from from the let's start from the beginning. So normally you log into Web Console. This is the screen that you see, and if you come into the administration screen and you go to mail configuration, mailbox configurations, you'll see that there's a default one here, right? And you can blow this away if you want to. This is just really provided more as an example. But so go to uh, create mailbox configuration and, um, you know, give it a, give it a name, um, you know, right? You wanna make this active. And this message here is really misleading. Um, it's not the username, it's actually the email address this is coming from, right? So in our case, this is gonna be, you know, no reply at openup.com, right? The next thing is also, it, it's, to, it's, a, it's a prefix. So any emails that comes out of this open IM instance, the subject should have a prefix. And, and it just helps to kind of identify what these messages are. And usually we prefer that the prefix also indicates which environment it is, right? Especially if you have production and QA, if, if messages are going out from QA, you, you want people to know that it's coming out from QA. You don't want there to be confusion uh, between, you know, which environment this is coming from, right? So um, you can just say, you know, um, you know open IM, you know, uh, UAT, for example, right? 
And then the next part is, um, is we're going to put in the SMTP. Now, in this case, it's going to be the same. We're going to say no reply, and we're going to drop in our password. Now, this is where that failover comes in. So if you had another configuration, you could link it to that second configuration, right? So this is why you, you're, you're allowed to have more than one configuration here. And, um, and and this is generally good. Now, you'll see this setting here called simulation mode. And, and this was added um, maybe about two or three months ago. Um, and, and the reason being is uh, almost all the time we, we need to test before we can go live. And the last thing that people want to see are emails being sent out all across the enterprise or in, in by error and then causing a great deal of alarm, right? So you put it into simulation mode and basically what it will do is you can tell it who it should go to, right? So instead of going to the actual recipient, it's going to go. So if I wanted to send it to me, I would just put my you know email address in here, right? And so here I'm going to go ahead and save. Um, I forgot to pick the template. So I want Office 365, right? And now I can save. Okay, so we're good here. Let's just go ahead and, and send a test. So I'm going to send a message to myself. And I'm going to say, you know, And if I click on send test mail, it should go ahead. Now, if there was a problem with the configuration, you'd see an error over here. And so this went through and um, let's see if I can pull this up. So this was the message that we just sent out, right? And uh, so this way uh, we can validate that we have SMTP configuration working. Okay. Now, that being said, let's go back to our slides. Um, So the next thing is is when do when now that we've configured these, um, we want to control, you know, when they're going to go out, right? So if you remember the transformation script that we that we created, and this is, was to bring data in from uh, your CSV file, your source system, and you're going to onboard or offboard users, right? And so in the onboarding, there was a setting where you can, you know set the email credentials to your supervisor or to the new user, you can set them as true or false. So if these are enabled, then it's going to use the predefined templates and it's gonna send them a message, right, as part of this. And so these are standard behaviors and these are already built in, right? It's just a matter of turning them on and off. There will be times when you need to go deeper and you need to control uh, what is it that you're sending out? It, it may not just be the same cookie cutter message, right? So there is an option where you can use the API and you can build your own message. And um, so there's a send email request object, populate it. And um, you're then going to basically, you know, call RabbitMQ, which is the message bus, and send that um, you know, mail request. Uh, to Rabbit and to the API to go ahead and send this out, right? So this way you can you can um, you know send out your own notifications, which are well beyond whatever is you know has been basically predefined, right? Um, okay, so we did this. Now going back a slide, we made reference to a couple of email templates. Now these templates you can also find them in the web console. And let's go back um, here. I'm jumping around between browsers. Also admin under administration, you can go down below and there's a mail template um, you know, editor. And so if we look at the, the two emails which I pulled out, uh, the templates, which was new uh, user email supervisor, 
and these are pretty bare bones, right? It just has, you know, user first name, so last name, but you can go ahead and write whatever text you want here and make it look a little bit nicer. You can, um, you know, make it HTML aware and, and improve the formatting as well. Now, if you want to add other fields, there's a bunch of fields here which have been predefined. So you can pick from these standard fields and include them on here, right? So let's say, um, you know, I want to add, um, oh, let's say the manage system name, right? So here, it's just going to drop it in wherever your cursor is, but you can move it around to wherever you want and then, um, you know, include those other attributes in there. All right. Um, there was, there's a question. Okay, uh, this question is, uh, is there a way to create a new email template so uh, that it will it can be used with the RabbitMQ um, email bus? So um, I think you're talking about adding new templates over here, right? Um, as opposed to just customizing these. All of these values are actually in the back end. So if you wanted to, I think through SQL, you could create another entry in here and you could set this up. The upcoming version, I think uh, 422, this has been improved quite a bit. So you can create new new templates uh, from here. And um, yeah, so you're not restricted, but there is a workaround where you can go ahead and do this from the back end as well, right? And um, I'll make a note of this and we'll include an example of how to do this as well, because I know this question has come up with quite a few people, um, you know, over the last several months. Okay. Yeah. Also, like, you know, talk about the new version. I think one of the other painful points was about the Groovy Manager. So that's been improved quite a bit too. And there is, you know, better searching and uh, digging in there. And also there's an ability to kind of version uh, the, the scripts as well. Right. So there's a little bit more capability in, in that version. Um, okay, so the question is, what if I need to add um, other custom attributes values to the email? So the ones that we provide out of the box have been kind of made a little bit easier. Um, you you can, these email templates, so this is just Groovy script as, in, um, so let's just pick one of these, right? So in, in concept, you can, you can do whatever you want within Groovy. So we'll find an example where you can, uh, you can do that and also, as a follow-up question is, you know, how do you manage you know, multi-language mail notifications? Um, you know, you're right. You know, we, we, we should have an attribute in here where you can have one email template and have multiple versions of it for each language. I mean, the same way we do it in other parts of the application, right? It's a good point. And, you know, we'll add it back into the product team and see if we can work it in uh, to the next release. You know, thanks for the suggestion. Okay, um, uh, there's a question, okay, about what's the difference between a mail template uh, editor and a mailbox configuration? So um, it's a good question and it's a little bit confusing because last night when I was actually doing this, I ran into the same problem myself because I didn't, re I didn't remember what the mail template editor was for. So the mailbox configuration is about your SMTP configuration. It's about the details of how you know you're going to integrate with say with Office 365 or with Google Workspace. Um, the email template editor is the the email template, the body of the email that's going to be getting sent out, right? So just think about the the editor as being about the the text, whereas the configurations are about the SMTP integration itself. Okay. All right. Let's go back to our slides. Um, we covered sending emails, we've gone through these, okay. Um, another thing that comes up quite a bit, and I'm kind of shifting gears a little bit from the, um, uh, and, and so we, you know, from, from basically emails, right? So there, we have some predefined workflows in, in, in open end, like, so like things like, you know, new hires, your self-registration, your access requests, your access certifications, there, there's a whole bunch of them, these, these workflow templates that you have. and they are uh, integrated into certain processes. Like if you want to do new hires, uh, it will, you know, it's a new hire with workflow and it will trigger the workflow. But there are times like when we're building out a system where 
you know, you're, you're, you're running a synchronization task. And in that synchronization task itself, you need to start a workflow, right? So like, let's say, um, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, let's say I'm, I'm onboarding a new user and um, there's a permission that I'm going to give someone uh, or, or let's say that I need to, um, this is a little bit more realistic. As part of the onboarding activity, we need to have, um, a, you know, a, a, a you know, the, the manager requests certain things, right? So we can send them an email notification or we can start a workflow, which will have some predefined things in it and have them approve it, right? So this example that we're kind of showing here is, is showing how we can initiate workflows under our own control, right? So again, just like we did with email, we are building up the request model, right? You know, populating with all the appropriate values and at the down here, we are, um, you know, sending it off the RabbitMQ. Now, in the examples, I've made it a point to include all the import statements because um, un until we start republishing our the, the Java docs that we used to, this is the part that's a little bit painful for people new to open and to figure out what is it that I'm going to be importing in, right? So this is the reason why each one of these script examples has these imports added to it, okay? Um, so question again, going back to, so do you mail template editor and mail uh, box configures have any interdependency on each other? No, they don't. They're completely separate things. They just have a name that looks a little bit confusing. So uh, the, the mailbox configurations, entirely about SMTP configurations. Um, it's literally about like, you know, um, what your service account you're going to use for your SMTP relays, uh, the port, the host, um, you know, is it going to be secure or not secure? The templates are only about the text and it knows nothing about the configuration. Those templates can be used literally with any uh, SMTP gateway, um, you know, barring any kind of filtering or, you know, um, any other activities that may be going on there. Okay, so we've covered some of the background stuff, right? So we've, you know, talked about sending out, um, um, you know, you know, the setting of SMTP and sending out emails. Talk about workflows. Um, we're we're going to talk about transfers now. So transfers are also called movers. These are the the this is what happens to people when they move, uh, you know, through the life, you know, through their life within a corporation, right? They they join, um, they have a certain title, they're part of a certain department, they move, uh, they go to another place. And, and so with that change, usually comes a change in access. So um, the entitlements that I need to do one job may be very different than what I need to do another job. But if I'm gonna change jobs, then and I have these things which I don't need anymore, they should be taken away, right? So. There's a few parts of this problem that we need to look at. And, and, and again, this is largely automated. You don't really need to do much work you know, for this. So the first uh, part is um, kind of highlighting what is gonna trigger the, the uh, transfer. So normally it could be like a job title or a job code. Um, another option, which is it can also be a supervisor, not likely, right? It could also be like a department or organizational change. So once these one of these attributes you know changes, uh, what's if you have birthright access, it's going to recalculate it automatically. So in this case, there's really nothing for you to do. So those business rules that we had, remember, it had a condition where you know things are assigned when they match, and then there's another part of that which is, you know, the things which are taken away when they don't match anymore, right? So if my job title was architect and, um, you know, say six months later, I'm going to, you know, transfer to a new role and my job title is now, you know, department manager, then that business rule that mapped to architect is going to be refired again because now those conditions are no longer true and it's going to take away the things which are not needed anymore. A second rule of fire, which is the one for manager, and it will give me the things that I need for that, right? Now, 
if there are entitlements which are common to both of them, they will stay. So we won't take away things which are not needed, right? So this part is going to get taken care of automatically um, by the by the business rules. The part that doesn't get taken care of automatically are um, entitlements that you know are gained outside of um, the, the these business rules, right? So maybe if an admin assigned them to you or you went through the request approval uh, process, we'll we'll be covering the request approval process next time, right? So, um, and for this, what we usually want to do is we want to have a workflow where the access that you gain to these other mechanisms is, is going to go to your new manager and you can review it, right? So for that, in... Um, and again, we're going to stay in administration. We're going to sort of system configuration over here. And if you go to the workflow tab, you'll see um, down below. So first of all, um, it's a default position ID that this is going to trigger position change, right? So let's say it's going to be job title or it's going to be you know um, one of these two. And then let's say I want, you know, supervise. If I need a second attribute, I can pick that, right? This box down here, um, initiate access requests for selected roles and groups. It's not really well worded. What it really means is that you want to you want to perform, um, you know, it basically it, it's an access certification on uh, access that's been gained um, outside of the birthright access, right? So. If you turn this on, it's going to go ahead and, and do that. Um, and it's going to, um, yeah. Uh, so this will, this will take care of, you know, driving that whole workflow uh, process. Another thing also to keep in mind is all the workflows, their resources here. So if you go to resource and if we go to activity, you'll find um, all the different requests templates, which are there out of the box, right? So you'll see things for enabling, disabling. Um, I'm just seeing that there's one for a position change. New resource. Uh, there is. So this is review all access, right? So if I open this up and if I go to the approver associations, I can define in here what the flow should be, right? So it could be the manager, it could be, you know, so again, it's just, this is common across all the workflows, right? Uh, yeah. So this is kind of, um, you know, the, the whole transfer process that we need to be able to set up. And then the next part uh, that I want to cover today is okay the the, the terminations. Um, okay, this thing there is okay. So there's a question. Uh, initiate access request was selected. Does this mean that a new user given birthright access will need to be approved by the resource owner? No. So. Birthright access is going to get calculated outside of the workflows. Um, the idea is that it's birthright, meaning that you're, it's your, it's automatically granted to you, right, based on certain conditions. Uh, only things which are gained outside of that birthright access should go through an approval process, right? Um, okay, going back to transfers, transfer, I'm uh, sorry, terminations. Terminations are also called levers, and there are really uh, three types. Of, um, of 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 terminations, we have the automated terminations, right? That's like you know you pick it up from your HR system, it's going to get processed on some flag, and it's going to terminate the user. Um, there is a termination by an admin, right? Uh, there's also um, a termination by the manager. Both of these terminations, which are by a manager and an, and an, and and the admin. I would kind of classify them as an as an emergency termination if this corporation is using an HR system which is driving this, right? If it's not, then that's different. But um, you know, in, in these cases, it you know, uh, I would kind of classify them to to separately. 
Also, one thing um, to keep in mind is um, in OpenIM, there are two types of user statuses. There's a user status and an account status. The user status is, is kind of aligned to your HR status. So it's like, you know, uh, it's a pending new, you know, new, you know, pending, uh, you know, login, it's active, and you're on leave, um, you know, um, you're, you know, you can, you can get terminated, right? Um, the account status is, is um, has a value like disabled, meaning that I can disable you and then later on I can bring you back to being active or I could terminate you after that, right? So it gives you a little bit of flexibility in terms of how you, you do this. When you implement your termination flow, um, there's a few things that you need to think about. And, and it should align with your corporate process, right? Which is already there. So meaning, you know, should the accounts be disabled or should they be deleted, right? So, and, and we've seen examples in our client base, which are some want to delete, some want to, um, um, you know, they, they, they don't, they basically disable them and they keep them in a disabled OU. It works fine for AD. It doesn't work fine for other applications, right? But again, it, it depends on where the data is going to be sitting. Um, other customers, they want to disable first, and then they want to wait 30 days or 60 days, and then they want to delete. They usually keep that time period for some kind of forensics uh, time to kind of, you know, check to see if anything, you know, was, you know, going on with this user that they want to be able to uncover. Um, other things to consider is, do you want to remove the entitlements during the termination process, or do you want to leave them as is, or do you want to end date them, you know? And then what should happen in OpenIM, like, you know, because you can have two different behaviors, right? You can, you can delete the account in, let's say, an, an LDAP or an AD uh, on a termination, but it could still, it, it will still exist in OpenIM for, for history and the status will be terminated. Um, and the entitlements that you have, they can be end dated, right? So you can see when somebody got it and someone, someone didn't get it, right? Um, so th these are these are things that we need to think about, right? And you know, the the most common one that people are going to implement is what to do. Um, you know, how do you do it in the in the automated sense, right? So again, so here I, we put together an example. And again, we're kind of highlighting two things that need to be updated. You need to update your transformation script and you need to update your policy map, right? And in your policy map, there are two scripts in particular. Again, this is from the context of AD. You need want to do your path if you're going to disable them and move them to like a disabled OU or, uh, and your account status, right? You want to be able to deactivate that account. So in this case, what we did was here's, um, you know, an HR system, the value is called worker status. And we're saying that basically if the worker status has been terminated, then do something. Now, the fact that we assign P user, the user object status to be terminated, that alone is gonna trigger a termination in OpenIM. So this do something here is only to take, to do other things beyond um, the actual termination of the, of the user, right? And then, um, Beyond this, um, we wanted to be able to do things in our policy map, right? So this is in our path. We're basically saying if it's terminated, um, you know, here we're gonna go change the display name. We're gonna say that this was terminated. And then we're gonna also uh, set the path. We're gonna put them into a disabled OU uh, path, okay? So these are the things that you need to do to handle terminations. Now, if I were to do it, uh, create an example out of this, let's go and, um, Let's log into um, our system that we had from earlier. Okay. So we had um, a CSV file, right? That looks like this. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take uh, Jack here and we're gonna make him uh, a developer. Right, and we're gonna take this guy George, and we're gonna terminate him. Right. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and do a sync.
and it should go ahead and update these in a second, right? And a couple of things should happen. So first let's, um, we'll wait till, um, see these things get processed. So, yep, I think that the so let's let's pull up um, the terminated user. We'll just search by their employee ID. So we see that the status has been terminated. Right. So this is the so this is what I was saying earlier. I was saying there's a user status and an account status. So this could have been saying active, and this could have said disabled. Right. So that's another way of kind of kicking this person out. Um. We also uh, had a second user that we did a transfer for. Okay. And let me just check to see which who this person's supervisor is. So this is Jack. And I'm pretty sure if I go into my self-service app, And let's um, go ahead and grab some of these the credentials for this guy. So there's a question. Um, What's the difference between a user status and an account status? So this is kind of what we were talking about earlier. So the user status tends to align or it should align with the, the status coming from your HR system, meaning, you know, um, you know, have they been hired yet? Or, I mean, you know, is the first time they're logging in? You know, are they active? Are they on leave? Um, you know, there's even a status for if somebody that you know somebody died, right? It said deceased on it. Um, you know, there there's bit you know, and then you can have terminated because some some companies, uh, well, and th there's a real life scenario where you may just want to disable someone. So the the idea is that what happens if a person was active and you disable them? Now you need to restore them back to their original status. That's kind of the reason why we have these two different status values. So it allows you to go back to what your original HR status was. So this way, the account status is really, you know, a secondary status on there to allow us to kind of do these kind of things, right? So it can be, you know, disabled. Um, it could be, you know, something else. So uh, if I go to, you know, if I go in as a manager and I disable them, that's, you know, what I would, you know, I would see. Okay, so um, in this case, we um, had a request. There should have been a transfer request that we see coming in here. And sure enough, we see a position change for Joe Smith, right? And we open this up and we see all the access that they have outside of Birthright. And I need to review it. And then after that, the security manager needs to review it, right? So we're basically forcing a certification. And here I can say, you know what? Um, all of these are fine, but no, he doesn't really need uh, the IM admin group, right? So I can revoke this. And at this point, it's going to go to the security manager. And also it's going to basically go ahead and, and terminate uh, that access, right? Um, earlier, we talked about uh, administrative-based operations and manager-based operations. So now since I'm logged in as a manager, I can go to user access and I can view direct reports. And for all the people who are reporting to me, I can uh, perform a bunch of operations on them. I can create requests, review their access, or I can disable them. And I can give them a reason why, right? You know, uh, test. There might be times I want to kick a few people out at the same time. So I can initiate a bulk request. And I can say, you know, and now I'm going to go down to the next. Actually, that wrong operation. Let's go 
go back here again. Actually, I'm wrong. It only works with contractors. I take that back. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, bulk operations for disabled only, you know, that's uh, more on the admin side. It's not on this side. Uh, with that being said, let's go to the admin side and we can see, you know, how those operations work. Um, so the question is, can uh, manager permissions be restricted, like preventing them from being able to disable um, their employees access? Yeah, absolutely. So all of those options that we saw there, um, those are all role-based. So I can control how much of that capability I want to you know, make available, if at all. So like maybe you may want to allow view, at, you know, view their access and maybe you know, create requests, right? But maybe you want to take away the capability to disable um, you know, maybe, you know, unlock and you know, th those kind of operations could be taken away, right? So, so definitely you can control that. Um, yeah, let's log in as a sysadmin. So, uh, here we're acting as an admin, um, and let's say, you know, I find a user, you know, that we created and I can perform a number of options, you know, operations from changing their, put the, putting them on leave, um, terminating users, um, uh, enabling, disabling them, you know, changing their activation and resetting the account as well. Right. Um, if I want to do bulk operations, right, there's user bulk operations. And so here, uh, let's just say I'm gonna, you know, pick a few. Let's so if I pick these operations, and then I go to choose operations. Then from here, I can say, you know, again, okay, it looks like I'm wrong on every single account today. Um, these are only limited to, I guess, uh, the access request capabilities, not for bulk terminations. Um, Going back, that's pretty much what we have planned. So everything that we've been doing has been kind of logged in the log viewer. And this is like kind of like a low level log, right? That, you know, so everything, the authentication is the disabling, it's all been tracked. Um, so the question was, can, can you distinguish between birthright access and discretionary access when doing mover um, access reviews? Um, there is a way of doing that. I think that we generally will rely on an attribute that's being added in to indicate that these permissions were granted through birthright access, whereas others that were taken out, um, you know, are are through um, through, the, through, through the whole request approval process. It in when we we're when we're doing the whole mover, uh, the whole joint or mover levers process, it's easy because the birthright access rules are taking care of it. And an access certification, it's a little bit harder. And that's where kind of having an extra flag, you know, it comes in handy for us to be able to know which one is which, right? Okay. Um, any other questions? I can help answer them. But I think for our session today, this is kind of what we had planned. Um, you know, thanks again, everybody, for making the time and the questions. Uh, the I think the questions that make it definitely very helpful to kind of go deeper into uh, into each one of these topics. Okay.